leave meeting. So to our speaker, we'll move straight along. How smart a fish? Well, our speaker tonight, Cullen Brown, is about to enlighten you. Cullum is a well-known champion of fish intelligence and welfare. He did his science degree at the University of Melbourne, honours and PhD at the University of Queensland, multiple postdocs post at Cambridge University, University of Edinburgh and the Smithsonian. He was a lecturer in animal behaviour at the University of Canterbury before moving to Macquarie University, where he is now a professor and teaches vertebrate evolution and behaviour. Callum has made a significant contribution to the study of behavioural ecology of fishes over his research career. His research niche lies in the study of fish behaviour and its application to fisheries science, with his most significant contribution being the enhancement of our understanding of fish cognition. So with that introduction, I'll hand over to Callum now to make his presentation. Thanks, Callum. Thanks, Kim, and thanks everybody for having me and inviting me along. I think um, hopefully what I'll do by the end of this is completely change the way you view fishes. So we'll see how we go. You can you can vote at the end to see if you've you've all learned something and found your worldview has changed. Um, so let's see if I can get these things slides to go. It's always tricky when you're doing Zoom and slides simultaneously. Mm. I think um, the first thing I I want to I guess point out is that there's lots and lots of different ways that people interact with fishes. Some of them are pretty obvious. We eat them, hence this big pile of sushi. Uh, we catch them for fun. Wreck fishing is a is a huge pastime in Australia and our sport around the world. We also keep fish as pets, and it might come as a surprise to some people that there are more pet fish than there are any other animal. So they're the most popular uh, pet in the world. Of course, we spend so much time catching wild, wild fish to eat that we've pretty much destroyed the ocean supply. And aquaculture has grown exponentially in its place. And in fact, over the last couple of years, aquaculture production of fish for food uh, or human consumption has outpaced and now is the dominant source of fish protein for, for people. People also find out, um, I guess it's a little bit surprising that fish are also very widely used in scientific research, not just me, who's just interested in fish for the sake of fish, but increasingly fishes are used as a replacement for lab rats uh, in the science medical world. So after rats and mice, fish are the next most popular um, species used for scientific research. Of course, if you're interested in biodiversity and conservation, there are more species of fish than all the other vertebrates combined. So another good reason to work with fish. And of course, all these different ways that we interact with fish have welfare and uh, animal ethics um, associated with them. So we need to think a bit more about how we think about fish, how fish might view the world, and subsequently how we treat fish ourselves. So one of the things that I pointed out is that there are a lot of fish, um, 32 and a half thousand species currently described uh, and heaps, heaps more, between 200 and 300 new species are described every year. And that's partially because, you know, the, the vast majority of the Earth's surface is, of course, covered in the oceans, some 70% or so. And the average depth of the ocean is about four kilometres, but the deepest parts of the ocean are about 11 kilometres down. So there's an awful lot of water, uh, so it's perhaps not surprisingly, the most diverse organisms are fishes. And one wonders why we call it Earth. We should probably call it water or, or something a bit more appropriate. But you know, the Earth is blue for a reason. It's because there's a lot of water. Now, you know, the oceans is just one environment, but even within the oceans, there's a, a heap of different sorts of niches that fishes can occupy. And I've got just two of the most, I guess, yeah. contrasting environments that you might fish, find fish in. First one, this is a little desert goby. So these guys are found in the desert springs out in central Australia, the artesian bores, where the water temperature can be 40 degrees or more. And at the other end of the extreme, you have these Antarctic ice fish, which are found living between the layers of ice in Antarctica, where the water temperature is between minus one and a half and minus two. 
Uh, and so they're, they're an amazing group of fishes that are specially designed for these um, sub-zero temperatures. They have antifreeze in their veins, literally. So there's a huge number of species, a wide diversity of, of fish. Of course, they've been around for about 400 million years. So, you know, given that, it should not be surprising that we see such huge complexity. There's a lot of diversity. And because of that complexity and all the different sorts of habitats that they live in, they are also really interesting from a, a cognition perspective, how smart they are, because cognition and intelligence is shaped by the environment the animal lives in. Of course, fish sadly have a pretty bad press uh, in terms of their people's expectation of their intelligence, I suppose. Most people will have heard of the goldfish three second memory or five second memory or something. And there have been countless ads on TV and elsewhere that really plays on this idea that uh, fishes have no memory whatsoever. This is just one of the ones that I, I grabbed from the internet where this fish swims around the bowl and every time it comes around, it sees this sultana brown and it's like surprised and it reels off some random fact about you know how sultana brown is good for you or whatever but every single time it does a lap it's forgotten uh, what's what it's going to see and that that I think is the stereotypical view of fish intelligence amongst the vast majority of people however if you guys have seen Finding Nemo there's this very interesting character Dory uh, he's one of, she's one of my favourite uh, characters, but my, my kids find her hilarious because she suffers from short-term memory loss. And it's, it's obvious even to my children who are all in primary school that this animal could not possibly get by in the real world if it didn't have some kind of capacity for learning and memory. She doesn't know her name. She knows nothing about her history, where she came from, where she's going, where her house is, nothing. Uh, so even to my kids, this, this character is hilarious because it's blatantly obvious that it cannot be a real thing. So I think Dory is pretty useful from my perspective. And the reality is that we know an awful lot about fish intelligence, and we have done for a very long time. This is um, one of the books that I edited. Um, it first came out in about 2006, and it came out as a second bigger edition in 2011. And... Myself and others have written a whole heap of review papers on fish intelligence. So fish are way, way smarter than most people uh, give them credit for. So one of the things that I like to do, and this applies to pretty much any animal, but what I'd like to do is try to get inside the animal's mind and to view the world the way that the animal views it. Um, you ask these sorts of questions, you know, how does the animal see the world? What do they taste? What can they hear? What, they, what sort of things do they feel? And by doing that, you can kind of generate an idea within your own mind of what it might like, might like to be a fish or, or some other animal. To do that, I really like to start with the environment because fishes are literally living in a completely different environment to us, a foreign environment that most of us are not familiar with and we're certainly not comfortable in. And because you know humans are reasonably visual animals, they usually start with the the visual environment of water. And one of the classic things about water is that you get this distribution of colors. So this is the full color spectrum at the surface, making up white light. But water rapidly absorbs um, the energy and it does so primarily from the red end of the spectrum. So by the time you get down to just 10 meters and most people can duck dive to those sorts of depths, you've lost red light already and only about 16% of the remaining light uh, exists. And by the time you get to 100 metres, well, it's only 1% of the light and everything's blue by that stage. Now, as I mentioned, the average depth of the ocean is 4 k's. The deepest ocean trenches are 11 kilometres down. So only in the very surface waters is vision even relevant to most of these animals. Of course, by, by the time they lose um, light completely, they rely on other sorts of um, sensors. This is the sort of typical thing that we often see when we think of coral reefs, we think of these bright, vibrant colours. And one of the reasons that these are vibrant colours and, and things that you can see here is that they have the full spectrum of light available on that top couple of metres of water. Of course, it dies off pretty quickly. But perhaps more interestingly, unlike us, we have just three um, cones in our eyes that enable us to see colour. 
but fish have many more. In fact, the default for a reasonably shallow living fish is four cones. So they can see more colors more vividly than we're capable of doing, which makes you start to think. They can also see into the UV spectrum. They can see polarized light and all sorts of weird things. And this funny little set of Pac-Mans here, to us, we see a white square amongst those Pac-Mans. That's a little trick our mind is playing on. Of course, that white square doesn't exist. It's just a couple of Pac-Mans facing each other. But in fact, fishes, because their visual processing is so similar to ours, they also fall for these sorts of um, um, tricks and illusions. Of course, once you get deep, um, fish have all sorts of solutions to, to, to sight. They can have their own sets of lights on their heads. Here's an example of a, a deep sea fish with bioluminescence. So effectively, they have a, a set of torches that are illuminating the area around them. They can also develop these very, very big and sensitive eyes. So many of them can detect prey by looking at the silhouette of things above them. So really they're, they're focusing on shadows and, and silhouettes rather than, than the light itself. Of course, fishes and particularly sharks are renowned for being very sensitive to um, smell and taste. In fact, you've probably heard that a shark's sense of smell is about 10,000 times better than our own, which is a little bit mind boggling. But many, this is the case for many fishes and in fact, Fishes are not restrained in the way that we are. They can have taste buds all over their face. And this is a nice little goat fish, which you often see in the shallows around Sydney Harbour. These guys actually have taste buds on the end of these whiskers. They're called barbels. And they can literally taste the prey items hidden in, in, in the sand and the mud as they put these feelers uh, into, the, into, that, um, into that environment, which is pretty cool. Of course, most of you will also be aware of the life history of trout and salmon, where they are born in a, in a stream, they move out as uh, juveniles into the ocean as adults, and then after two or three years in the ocean, they return not just back to the same river that they were born in, but exactly the same part of the river that they were born in. And they do that based on the smell of the river. Again, this is kind of mind boggling. Imagine being out in the ocean and being capable of detecting the chemical signature from a single river. So that gives you some idea of how sensitive these animals are. Of course, the underwater world is extremely loud. Now, unfortunately, our ears aren't very good at picking that up, but for a couple of hundred dollars, you can buy a hydrophone and connect it to your, your, your standard digital phone, and you can record all sorts of noises that are occurring underwater. And believe it or not, there's so many animals making noises underwater that there's a dawn and dusk chorus underwater just in the same way as we hear uh, on land. Of course, fishes have uh, the same sort of inner ear that we do. In fact, we inherited our inner ear structure from a fish. So they have ears in the same sense that we do, but they also have a lateral line, which means that their entire body surface is capable of detecting vibrations uh, through the air. So fishes are extremely sensitive to vibrations and sound traveling underwater. Many of you will have heard um, the idea of whales producing songs that can be heard for kilometers. And the reason that sound is so important underwater is because sound travels magnificently underwater, um, far, far better than it does uh, on, on land. And so given that it should not be surprising that at the moment we know roughly 50% or more of, of fish species are making meaningful noises underwater to communicate with one another in the same way that birds talk to one another on land using various songs and chirps and carrying on. And here is a really nice example. Many of you will be familiar with this fish species. It's haddock, it's from the North Atlantic. It's a very popular um, eating fish. But in this species, the males actually have some very spe special muscles associated with their swim bladder that they can vibrate uh, and create tunes and those vibrations and the tunes that they make is what attracts the females to them. So they rely specifically on making these noises uh, to attract uh, females. And there's a whole bunch of other ways that fish can make noises. This is just one example. Now, fishes are also really, really sensitive to electromagnetic um, radiation. So underwater, as you all know, electricity travels extremely well which is why they always say, you know, don't get in the bath with your hairdryer because it does not end well. 
electricity passes beautifully through water. And there are a whole bunch of species that use electricity not just to locate prey, for example, a shark can actually detect the neurons firing in your body. Um, but there are others like this cool little uh, elephant nosed fish from South America that actually generate pulses of electricity and can not only navigate using that, it's equivalent to sort of sonar or radar, except it's using electricity, they also communicate with one another using electric pulses uh, through the water, which is a little bit mind boggling for us because we obviously cannot detect any of these things ourselves. Many, many fishes like birds are also sensitive to the Earth's magnetic fields. So there's some theory that suggests that uh, humans could do this historically. Um, we may even have some sort of residual potential to do this, but sharks and rays uh, and other fishes are very sensitive uh, to these sorts of um, fields, electric fields. Uh, these electromagnetic fields are obviously very useful if you're migrating over vast distances. Birds, for example, migratory birds use them to move from the north to the south hemisphere and so on. But what you may not know is that it also can be useful on fine scale as well to help you get around. Uh, and that's because the magnetic crust and the magnetic field when the Earth's crust was formed maintains the original polarization of the Earth when it, at that point in time. And you may know that the poles magnetic north and south poles have been shifting around slightly and at times have completely reversed. So there's a little map on the sea floor that uh, it's, if you have the appropriate magnetic sensors, you can also detect and use that for moving around. So there's a whole bunch of sensors that you can get some idea for the complexity of the sorts of sensors that fishes have. And the question is, what do they do with all that amazing amount of information? And here's what I call the Incredible Fishies fact file. And this is not a random selection of incredible fishy feats, but many of these things were thought to be unique to humans not all that long ago. I want to talk about fish memory to start with, because obviously that will completely debunk this whole three-second memory fallacy. But also fish have these really complex social structures. We'll talk about that a little bit. Um, they also rely on culture. So they pass information not only between each other, but generations and that can generate cultural information. They also cooperate with one another, they manipulate each other in, in interesting ways, they build houses and use tools. So many of these traits you would think are uh, only associated with highly intelligent animals, humans, um, perhaps chimpanzees or something like that, but in fact fishes do all of these things too. I wanted to start with learning because we want to debunk that uh, three-second memory uh, myth, I suppose. And one of the very simple um, forms of learning is, is something called classical conditioning. And many of you will have heard of Pavlov's dogs, where he rang a bell or pressed a, a button and created a tone and then presented the dogs with uh, a food reward. And after some pairings of those two things, the dogs would start to salivate spontaneously whenever they heard the bell ringing, right? So they no longer needed to see the food or even smell the food. They knew that when the bell rang, food would be available. So that's a very simple form of learning. And this is the same kind of experiment done on an extreme budget. This is the flashy from the back of my bicycle and a bit of electrical conduit. And all these fish are doing is learning that when the light comes on, food will soon arrive. And all you need to do is monitor where the fish are in the aquarium. And you soon find that the moment the light turns on, the fish approach the light and expect the food to arrive. So here's what that um, data looks like. This is a, a wild crimson spotted rainbow fish, a couple of captive populations, uh, another captive population of the crimson spotted and a northern species, the, the nigrans. This is the stripy fish up here. And you'll see that the, the wild fish learnt this very, very quickly. There's a slight discrepancy in the afternoons. That's because they're hungry in the morning. They're not quite so motivated in the afternoons. You see that pattern over and over. But, you know, by about eight or so trials, these fish had totally figured out that this random red flashy light meant that food was arriving. The captive fish, they took a little while longer, and that's because captive fish just aren't as smart. Um, they need environmental enrichment and these sort of life experiences to develop their brains and become smarter. Um, but they, they still learn it. Right? So by about 14 days, 
their behavior is just as good as the, the wild fishes. So they learn that very, very quickly. And here's another pretty random thing that this is actually one of the first uh, experiments I did as my honors. And in this, I was actually teaching um, a third year fisheries class about how fish um, respond to trawlers. And we, we created an artificial trawler net that moved up and down this very big aquarium. And in fact, we had an escape hatch that the fish had to learn the location of in order to, to avoid being caught in the net. And you can see that in just five trials, the fish had totally figured out where that escape route was. So that's some pretty rapid learning of this totally random thing. But then what's perhaps more interesting is that a year later, I retested those same fish and they carried on as if it was the same day. So they completely remembered the location of this, of, um, the, the hole in the, the net, some random thing that I had taught them you know, a year later, which is quite astonishing. That was one of some of the very best early evidence, not only of rapid learning, but of long-term memory in fishes. Fishes are also really, really good at spatial learning. So that's learning you to move around the environment in, in very directed ways. And this is a really nice ex experiment. You can see the date on this, 1951. This chap, in his spare time, built an artificial intertidal reef in his backyard. And he put a couple of gobies in these pools and exposed them to high and low tide over a series of days. And then he went in there and he frightened them. And he found that what the fish could do at low tide is they could leap from pool to pool. So if you scared them in pool B, they would leap to pool C. If you then scared them again, they would leap into the main pool. So during the high tide, they, they, they move out across the reef and they learn the spatial orientation of where the other pools are. And then at low tide, they can actually remember those locations in their mind. It's called a mental map of where all these neighboring pools are. So when they leap, they know they're gonna land into a pool and not on the, the rock platform, which is pretty remarkable. And he's done a, a couple of other experiments following up from that. And we've been working on intertidal gobies in my lab for about 10 years. Something a little bit more complicated is something called time-place learning. Time-place learning is a combination of learning an appropriate location, but associating that with a particular time of day. And this is a very simple experiment that one of my honours students did at the University of Edinburgh. He basically taught these fish, it's a little pistil, a bit like a guppy, that in the morning they would be fed at one end of the tank and in the evening they would be fed at the other end of the tank. Anybody can do this with their own fish at home. And all you need to do is keep track of where the fish are just prior to feeding time. If they're doing time place learning, as you can see in the black line here, after a couple of trials, they start moving to the appropriate location at the appropriate time, anticipating that food is going to show up at that time and place. Um, so you can see that that the fish learn that pretty quickly. This is a control situation where we, we just fed them at random locations at random times and they don't learn anything. So this is actually a random distribution of, of fish moving around in the aquarium. There's nothing to learn. So that, that's quite astonishing. Nobody's ever tried anything more than, than two places at two times for fishes, but in birds, there's one experiment showing that some species of birds can do four places at four times a day. Uh, nobody's done that in fishes, but it's something certainly on my to-do list. Of course, fish are more or less renowned for their schooling behaviour, and that sort of invokes a couple of questions, at least in my mind. The first one is, do they recognise one another amongst these groups uh, of individuals? They all look the same to me, but can they tell each other apart? And the other thing is, well, can they possibly learn by observing other fish doing things? They not only learn by themselves, but can they learn by observing others? And the answer to those two questions, as it turns out, is yes, they can. So this is a really nice example. Um, this is actually one of the first papers that I read about uh, individual recognition in fishes when, when I was a, an undergrad. This paper came out. And you can see here that what they've basically done is got a whole bunch of fishes that have never seen each other before. And they put them into these small groups, um, usually between eight and 12 individual fish within an aquarium. And then 
over a series of days, they give them a choice of spending time with their shoal mates at one end of the aquarium or a bunch of complete strangers at the other end of the aquarium. And this is showing that the amount of time they spend with the familiar individuals in these light boxes or these strangers in these dark boxes. And you can see by about day eight to 12-ish, they start to differentiate and, and actually choose to spend time with these familiar individuals. What's interesting is that if you then separate them back into their little isolated um, um, tanks and test them 12 days later, they maintain that preference for these uh, familiar individuals. And in fact, another PhD student from the same lab a couple of years later tested them again three or four weeks later, and they still showed this preference. So they not only learn to recognize these individuals and preferentially associate with them, they can remember the, those individuals for, for many, many um, days, if not weeks, which is really amazing for these tiny little fishes. One of the things that we did um, when I moved to Cambridge was to, to think about this idea about whether we could use social learning to train fish en masse to do all sorts of interesting things. And one of the big problems that I particularly was interested in was all these fishes that were reared in these hatcheries to bolster wild populations, either for fisheries or for conservation biology. The trouble is that many of these fishes die soon after releasing. And that's because they're reared in these artificial environments. They've never seen live food. They've never seen live predators or anything like that. And these are all sorts of behaviors that require experience, learning and memory in order to, to acquire the appropriate skills. We call it life skills training. And here what we did was we got these little um, Atlantic salmon. They're a couple of months old. We got them from the hatchery. We trained some of them to recognize live prey. And we were using these blood worms, which are actually the, um, the, the larvae of, of midge, a freshwater fly. And what you can do is you can put the blood worms down these tubes and feed these um, demonstrators either at the bottom or you can put it through this little slip at the surface and, and feed them at the surface. But the point of the, the story is that these demonstrators can demonstrate to naive observers the sorts of behavior that you're interested in, in teaching the fishes. In this case, it's foraging in a particular location, might be avoiding a predator or something like that. And here you can see the latency in black, the latency to strike at one of these prey items. And this is a pre-trained individual. That's pretty much what a live, uh, a wild fish would do. As soon as the, the worm is available, they strike at it and, and eat it immediately. In the pink here is this observer. This observer gets to watch the demonstrator do it and then try it themselves. And you can see that by six days, their behavior is indistinguishable from that pre-trained individual. So they learn it very, very quickly just by watching this other fish performing that behavior. We have some other interesting um, dots on this graph. This red, the red line here is a single naive individual by itself, so it's just how long does it take a fish to learn this by itself? And this trails off to about 12-ish trials for them to figure out by themselves. Social learning is about twice as fast as is uh, individual learning. And what's even more interesting is this green line. So in this case, we actually have two naive individuals, a naive individual on either side, and neither of them have a clue what's going on. And in one of the unusual things about hatchery fish is the first time they see live food that's moving, they're actually scared of it. And in fact, what happens is that the, the, the behavior, this, the frightful behavior of, of these two individuals upon seeing that live worm moving actually provides negative social feedback. So instead of the positive social feedback that this guy is getting, these guys are sending negative vibes and it actually takes them longer and longer to eventually try to attack and eat the worm. This is a kind of a negative social feedback whereas this is a positive social feedback. So it can happen both ways. One of the other cool things, this is a paper that came out reasonably uh, recently, just a couple of years ago. Um, this is a friend of mine, Mike Webster, who's now at the University of St. Andrews. He asked a slightly different question, and that is if, if different observers have different sets of knowledge, could they combine that information in some way to generate a, a new behavior? And so what he did, he had a whole bunch of untrained fish, clearly they don't have a clue what's going on. 
And then he had um, some that were trained to approach a light and get a food reward. Others that were trained to move inside a little box to get a food reward. And then he had a group of fish that had some individuals that are trained to the light and some that were trained to go into the box. And the tests of these shoals is how long does it take them to start foraging? The light comes on, they approach the light. Once they get to the light, they have to enter inside this little box to get their food reward. So they can't see the food until they get inside the box. Any combination other than when you have both of those individuals with those sorts of experience together, they just take ages to figure it out. Only 40% of the naive fish eventually figure it out, but it's way over 60%, it's more like 65% of the naive fish solve that problem if there are individuals within the school who have different aspects of the knowledge and that together they, they put it together and solve this novel problem. So I think that, that was really compelling for me. I'd never thought about having multiple demonstrators demonstrating different components of the behavior before. So Mike uh, kind of blew my mind on that one. So we talked a little bit about some um, social learning. And as I mentioned at the start, you know, a lot of the social learning experiments that we do often occur what we call peer-to-peer -peer within a generation. Of course, social learning can occur across generations as well. And, you know, as humans, when we think about teaching, we often think about, you know, the, the knowledgeable adult conveying information and knowledge to, to the younger pupil. So that's not always the case. Sometimes the kids teach us all sorts of stuff. So it can happen the other way, especially about technology and things like that. Um, but the point of this is, of course, is that knowledge can then transcend generations independently of genetics. Right? And this is the sorts of things that humans are kind of famous for. Um, having all sorts of weird cultural trends uh, that develop. Some of them make sense, a lot of them don't. Fashion is a really good example. It doesn't make any sense to me. So this is, and this is an, a really interesting experiment where we try to, to kind of uh, simulate that sort of uh, transgenerational transfer of information. And in this case, we, we taught groups of fish to do one of the two things. They could either swim through a red door uh, in order to access uh, a food patch, or they could swim through a green door. Completely arbitrary, the doors are side by side, they lead to the same compartment in which the, the food is hidden. And what we did is we started off with four pre-trained demonstrator fish, so these are the teachers, and a whole bunch of naive, what we might call pupils, we call them observers. And then gradually we replaced the teachers with naive pupils, right? So, by the time you get to this day four, for example, there's only one original trained demonstrator and there's seven naive. And then here, the original demonstrators are completely gone. Day five, six, and seven, they're all naive individuals. And you can see that both in the case of the preference for the green door and in the case of the preference for the red door, although there's a little bit of decay, there's still a substantial cultural preference amongst those groups of fish for this arbitrary color, a red door or a green door to access the food reward. And in fact, you can manipulate the location of the foraging patch where it would actually be faster to use the alternative route, but they still prefer to, to follow the cultural norms. This is an, an example of, of what that might look like in the wild. Uh, this was done a long time ago when you get actually get permission to do these kinds of mass population manipulations. This is a little French grunt. They're, they're quite common in the Red Sea and the, on the reefs there. And during the day, they hide out amongst these um, anemones for protection. And as dusk starts to fall, they take these very specific migratory routes across the reef to their preferred foraging patches. And of course, by the end of the night, they return safely to their home. Now, they, these particular guys had been watching these fish for a long time. And they noticed that new individuals seemed to recruit into these little local populations. And when they did, they seemed to be following the other fishes out along these migration routes, the feeding patch and back to the, you know, this, the sleeping um, location. And what they did then is transplant individuals between locations. And sometimes when they transplanted, they kept some of the residents in place. And other times they completely removed the residents. Now you can imagine, because this is a story about social learning, when some of the original inhabitants were there, Indeed, those naive individuals followed the rest of the group out to, to, 
to the foraging patch and back again to the hiding patch. But if none of the residents were there, the transplanted individuals went off on these random uh, trajectories, um, which actually were quite close to the trajectories they would have taken had they stayed at home. Um, so when there is some residents, the cultural information was transferred to the naive individuals. When the residents were removed, that, that information was completely lost. And the behavior was lost from the population. And of course, that has significant imp implications for fisheries uh, where we take the biggest and presumably the most knowledgeable individuals from fish populations all over the seas all of the time. Of course, fishers also fight. It's not all fun and games, not all fish are super friendly all the time. They also fight one another. And in this case, it's really important that you keep track of who's who. And fish can do that in lots and lots of different ways. One of the more interesting ways is something called transitive inference. So if a fish as a third party is watching other individuals fight, then they can use information. So for example, it sees fish A defeat fish B, and they see fish B defeat fish C, they can infer that if A came up against C, then A would prevail. So they can not only learn and figure out what these associations are, they can also insert themselves into the hierarchy from the third party perspective, which is pretty impressive. The other thing that many um, people who work on aggression in fishes have noticed is that when fish establish territories, Although there's a bit of bickering um, back and forth between neighbouring territory holders, once the territories are established, that, that relationship is reasonably stable. And in fact, what happens sometimes is if some transient individual comes in, then both of the neighbours will attack simultaneously and work as a team to get rid of that uh, invading fish. And that's called the deer enemy hypothesis that you, you know, you keep your enemies close and you become very familiar with them. Um, but sometimes, in fact, you know, the enemy of my enemy, <laughs> and that's how it works. Of course, fish also cooperate in other contexts. This is a couple of guppies inspecting a very, very big, scary pike cichlid. This is in the streams of, of um, Trinidad. And what happens usually when fishers are inspecting a predator, they, they, they do so in small groups, often in pairs. And they take it in turns at taking the lead and they tend to do this kind of movement back and forth, right? And that way they share the lead, which is the most dangerous position when you're inspecting a predator. Now, what should happen if this cheetah back here decided that it wasn't gonna take its fair share of the dangerous front position? And it turns out that this chap here would refuse to investigate a predator in the future if this individual cheats. So they remember the, the social position and the previous consequences of these, this cheating behaviour. So cheaters are punished in their society in the same way that we punish people in our own society by sending them to jail or, or whatever the, the fine for non-conformity might be. Cooperation doesn't just happen between species, um, and within species, but it also happens between species. Here's a really nice example of this beautiful coral reef groper. These guys go up to these big moray eels and they do a particular dance, which basically says, hey, how'd you like to come foraging with me? And they go off across the coral reef. These guys, normally they, they take off fish around the bombings and the fish can escape by going inside the bombing. And the moray eel does the opposite. It swims through the cracks and crevices, catching fish and the fish in that context, context escape by swimming out into the water. When they work together, there's literally nowhere for the, the prey fish to hide and their foraging success rate goes up astonishingly. We also have some really interesting social interactions happening between cleaner fish. This is a classic cleaner fish uh, cleaning a client fish here and these cleaners go around picking off um, parasites and, and, and dead skin um, and various things stuck in the animal's um, teeth or in their gills. And these Cleaner fish um, establish a, a particular location on, the, on a bombing called a cleaner station and their clients line up to be serviced and the cleaner can deal with hundreds to you know, a thousand different clients, clients in a day. And it's very important for the cleaner to maintain um, its reputation, its social reputation. 
But occasionally the cleaner makes a mistake and accidentally bites the gills or the, or the face of the fish or something of the client fish. And of course the, the fish will swim away. And what the, the cleaner does is it swims off after the client and it gives them a back rub using its fins. And of course, people have, have seen this happening underwater and nobody had the faintest idea that fish like back rubs. But it turns out if you put a rotating brush in an aquarium, fish will spontaneously swim up and give themselves a back rub. And in fact, if you look at the circulating cortisol, which is a stress hormone, the same one that you and I have, if you look at those, fishes that get back rubs are actually more relaxed, less stressed, and their circulating cortisol is lower. So this is a form of reconciliation. I'm sorry, I, I, may, I accidentally wrecked our association here. Um, and I'm trying to repair the relationship by giving you, basically it's like giving you a free fries with a burger or something, you know, I made a mistake, I'm gonna make it up to you. Fish also build houses, which may not sound all that interesting, but at least 9,000 different species uh, are known to build houses of various different sorts, ranging from very simple burrows to some very complicated masonry. One of my favorites, I could talk about the jawfish, but I'm gonna talk about the rock mover wrasse tonight. Rock mover wrasse has got a, a very apt name, and that's because every single night as it's going to bed, it collects a, a bunch of bits of coral and various debris, and it builds itself an igloo for the night. And in the morning, it busts open the igloo, forages around the, the reef again, and then at nighttime, it builds itself a new igloo. And it does this night after night after night, which is a fantastic way of uh, basically living in a tent, right? So you create a tent with materials that are at hand. We also now know that um, tool use is no longer uh, unique to humans, you know, Diane Fossey found, for example, a bunch of different chimps using tools, uh, fishing to crack open nuts and things. Not long after that, people discovered that various corvids and parrots were using tools. And it turns out that fishes are using tools as well. In fact, I'm trying to get some more money to study this as we speak. One of the, the papers we published recently was about these tusk fish. They go out across the reef, they pick up these huge bivalves sometimes urchins, which they can't possibly break in their own mouths. And they come back to these very specific locations and they repeat, repeatedly whack them back and forth against these anvils until they break open and they can get access to the food inside. Probably the, the best studied tool user of all the fishes is the archer fish. We have heaps of different species of archer fish in, in North Queensland. And these guys squirt water at insects that are associated with the terrestrial environment above the water, they have to account for the bending angle as light moves from water to the air. Many of you might have come across this if you're trying to go spear fishing or something in the shallows, you know, you put your spear out, but it's not where you think it is because the light bends as it enters the water. The fish have to learn this and they learn it very quickly. So tool use now is um, fairly well known amongst fishes. The wrasses are particularly well known. There's about 12 different species that we know around the world that are using anvils and these sorts of things. The last thing I want to talk about very briefly is uh, this concept of, of pain, considering I want to talk about welfare of fishes more, more broadly. And I guess the question that comes up time and time again is do fish feel pain? And the simple answer to that is, well, yes, the reason you feel pain is because you inherited all of the mechanisms uh, associated with pain perception from our fishy ancestors. In fact, the neurons that are responsible for detecting painful stimuli, they actually date all the way back to um, in worms and things like that. So whether or not the worms have the brain capacity to respond emotionally in the same way that we do to pain is a slightly different question. Certainly nociceptors have been around for a very long time. And what we know about the brain capacity of fishes certainly suggests that they respond to pain in exactly the same way that people do. Here's the sort of summary of the state of knowledge of, of pain um, criteria. What, what do we know about pain in mammals? You can see it's all green here. We've addressed all these questions in mammals. But you know, the only other group that we've also addressed all these other questions is, is fish. And that's because there's been a concerted effort over many, many years to address all these questions. Um, after that, it's birds, and then we have decapod crustaceans and, and cephalopods. 
So do not be surprised to find in the not too distant future that things like uh, cephalopods get added to our animal welfare legislation and also in New South Wales, you may already know that there are already rules and regulations pertaining to how you can kill crayfish and crabs and things like that. So I think uh, hopefully I've demonstrated to you that uh, fish have really good memories. They live in these complex social groups, they manipulate one another, they learn from one another, they develop these stable cultural traditions which can vary from species to species. They cooperate with one another, they manipulate one another as we saw with the uh, cleaner fish and its clients. They build these really cool houses and they also use tools. So hopefully the next time you go snorkeling or diving, whether you're in Sydney Harbour or whatever, you look at the fishes and you'll spend perhaps five or 10 minutes just sitting and watching them. And, and you'll probably be aware that their behavior then is far more complicated than you ever imagined it to be. That's it for me. You can follow us uh, at thefishlab.com. Um, pretty straightforward website. We have a really cool website. We also have a, a big presence on social media on Facebook and various other things. I guess we're approaching 45 minutes. We should probably stop and ask for some questions. That's great. Thank you, Cullen. <laughs> it certainly opened my eyes um, as to how fish respond and learn, etc. Uh, it's incredible um, how you frame the experiments to uh, to actually um, solve the problems and uh, and learn that they learn. I guess. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. One of the one of the tricky things about this business is trying to figure out how how to get the fish to show you what they know. Mm, mm. Um, okay. So, uh, are there any questions up on the chat line that you can see, Graham? While people are um, uh, any hands up? No. Perhaps okay. I can stop um, sharing my screen so we can see everybody. Okay. Um, I might hand. start with one just to. Jim, Jim's got his hand up. Okay. There you go. Um. Our uh, rivers have many barrages. Oh, I've lost Jim. Is it just Jim? Is <laughs> there okay. a barrage? Oh, Jim, you're back. Sorry, we lost you there for a minute. Could you repeat the question? I think we still lost him. And it looks like it. <laughs> yeah. Um, Kim, perhaps you can ask your question. There's a, there's a question in the chat. Oh, there's too, one on the chat. Uh, you could try that one. There must be variation between species in their abilities. Yes, indeed. In fact, the discipline that I, that I specifically work in is called behavioural ecology. And behavioural ecology is all about how the behaviour of animals suits the specific environment in which they live. Uh, and so one of the many many ideas that behavioral ecologists have with people who work on intelligence is that it's actually the everyday sorts of problems that animals face in their day-to-day -day lives that really is the most important thing about um, you know, why animals learn what they learn what they're capable of learning and these sorts of things um, so the environment the specific environment that they live in is very very important in in shaping the, the intelligence not just of fishes but all, all animals for a long time, we used to think it was all about how closely related to humans um, animals are, but in fact, it's got nothing to do with that whatsoever. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, I'll go with mine. Um, when I was up in um, uh, the mountains, Blue Mountains area over towards Gin Island Caves, um, I stayed on a farm. There was a creek running through it and it had trout in it. And uh, I learned to tickle fish and catch them that way. I was taught to just put my hand under the water, um, leaning over the bank, and leave it there for a little while. And then the fish came along, and you just tickle it on the belly. Yeah. Um, and then all of a sudden, you could flick it out of the water. Mm -hmm. uh, 
I only ever caught one, I think, really. You know, but <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it showed that I could do it. But uh, has that got any relationship to the, the back rubs that you said the fish like? Yeah, same kind of thing. I mean, they're initially attracted to you out of curiosity, particularly mm -hmm. if you're wiggling your fingers a little bit because they, right. they think that maybe there's something to be um, eaten there. But once they, they, they approach you and start interacting with your hands, they do like that tactile simulation, which is quite interesting. Um, so that's only a relatively new discovery, perhaps in the last 10 years or so, that people have really figured that out, particularly the, the cortisol component to it, so it reduces their stress. Uh, but it turns out heaps of different species like to have that sort of tactile stimulation. So I guess maybe it's a bit like having a hug, you know, everybody could use a hug from time to time. Yeah. Just like to, that, that sort of tickling sensation. I have to confess I've tried and completely failed uh, to do that. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, um, there's a, a related, yes. So, yeah, there's the one potential idea is that every aquarium should have some sort of rotating brush. Um, I haven't actually investigated this yet, but one idea is that you could actually have uh, a laser beam moving through the water. And as they approach and break the laser beam, it could automatically start the brush rotating and they could uh, help themselves. Mm. Okay, there's the next one there from Ben Joseph. Yes, um, great presentation. Two-part question, where do you think the smart, smartest fish live? And are Aussie fish smart? <laughs> yes, really good questions. Um, well, like, look, look, like most animals, the, the level of intelligence displayed by fishes is very much dependent on their lifestyle. Uh, and this is true of all animals, whether you're thinking about, you know, what's the smartest mammal or what, what's the smartest fish. Generally speaking, if a fish inhabits a very complicated environment, three dimensional, complicated, that it's interacting with that environment in meaningful ways. You know, you can immediately think of coral reef uh, environments, but perhaps also you know, many of the, the kelp forests, that lots of uh, cool temperate fishes inhabit. If it's complicated and they're having to actively move in interesting ways through that environment, perhaps by extractively foraging certain things in certain contexts in certain places at certain times. And that sort of complexity uh, certainly adds to the intelligence of a fish. So a really smart fish is one that tends to, to hunt things that it has to look for uh, in complex environments. But you know that's also true of, of mammals as well. So that's a, a sort of habitat complexity view of, of the evolution of intelligence more broadly. So that, that's a, an interesting one. In terms of Aussie fish, uh, look, it, it's difficult to say because there's been so much, so little work done on, on Australian fish species, but probably the standout uh, is the archer fish. And people started working on archer fish originally because of their, their amazing ability to squirt water at, at insects. But um, they've since been used in labs all over the world. And, and one of the really amazing aspects of archerfish that has been revealed recently is that they can not only distinguish individual fish from one another, but they can also tell the difference between human faces. And they can do that, um, they can distinguish between tens of different faces. And you can also teach them to differentiate between faces using this front on view, like we're looking at now. But then if you test them later by rotating the image round through 90 degrees, they can still differentiate human faces even when the image is rotated through 90 degrees, mm -hmm. which, I mean, it's kind of mind boggling. Why mm -hmm. the heck would a fish even care what a human looks like? The fact is they're, they're capable of doing it, which yeah. I think is amazing. Okay, thanks. Um, Deb, you've had your hand up for a while. Do you want to unmute and ask your question, please? Um, yeah, thanks, Callum. Very interesting. I'm a keen uh, snorkeler and dived in the past. But do you think that long-lived fish do have memories um, that last for decades? Because fish often respond to divers um, knowing that they'll get fed or they, you know, where tourists go regularly snorkeling. Fish yeah. seem to learn um, that they might get something to eat from these these people yeah yeah definitely so, 
that's that's really obvious, particularly in in marine national parks where they know they're not going to get speared or, or what have you. Um, mm -hmm. But there's been some really wonderful people who have emailed me over the over the years talking about how they go back to the same place time and time again and they interact with a particular individual fish and it comes up to them mm. and interacts with them and expects to be fed and so on and so forth. Um, that, that happens quite a lot. Um, some really good examples, you know, some of the really big wrasses um, mm. are particularly well known, the humphead wrasses and various others. There are others who have, have had similar sorts of experiences with individual sharks where they go mm. diving um, with individual sharks and the sharks seem to recognize them how they do that with all the scuba gear on i don't mm. know but they do and they come up expecting to be rubbed and, and get fed and all sorts of things so it's it's really remarkable and, and there's no doubt that fishers can learn those sorts of things and they retain that sort of information for a really really long period of time yeah um, the stingrays on the south coast are another example that regularly come yeah. up yeah. to fishing jetties, um, boat launching areas, but also approach you when you're snorkeling. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And they can be intimidating, right? Yeah. You know, a three or four metre ray, smooth ray, when it comes yeah. up, and they're not scared. They, they can be no. a bit culty too. So uh, I've seen toddlers pushed over <laughs> by these <laughs> down at Ben Long and Jarvis yeah. Bay and places. That's right. um, but one of my PhD students has recently uh, finished her PhD after four years she did a master's looking at um, tourists and fishermen feeding the, the, the smooth rays and yeah. she found that their behavior is so tuned in to not just tourists but um, the mm. fishermen, the local fishermen that they predict when the fishermen are going to be cleaning their catch and wait, wait in expectation mm. they do it particularly about around midday when the, when the mm -hmm. fishermen come back and they are really, really um, keen on weekends. Mm -hmm. So even if it's a rainy day and there are no fishermen out, the rays will be sitting there waiting. And it's one of the few examples of wild animals learning what a weekend is. Yes. Like yes. Tuned into human behaviour. The weekend is a completely artificial thing that we've invented, um, yes. but wild animals are so attuned to our behaviour that they can pick up on yeah, no, these are remarkable. Mm. Thanks mm. very much. Thank you. Uh, next one on the chat line is uh, from Gary Housley. Thoughts on fish active at night? Yes, so there are a number of different species that are active at night and a whole bunch of uh, other individual uh, species and even sharks and rays that are crepuscular. So that is that they're more active early morning and in the evenings. Um, but there are a whole bunch of fishes whose visual system is specifically designed to operate uh, during low light at night. Um, most people who have been um, snorkeling in the bay uh, during winter will have seen Port Jackson sharks in, in big numbers during the winter. Um, their visual system has been really well studied and they are a, a nighttime specialist. So there's all sorts of um, interesting information that you can find out about, you know, the, the sorts of rods and cones and things that they have in their eye and that can tell you the sorts of things that they can see and under what sort of conditions that they like to operate in. But yes, there, there are uh, definitely big differences. There are nighttime fish and there are daytime fish. And even within, say, for example, Port Jackson sharks, we've found that, in fact, some of them, despite the fact that they're supposed to be nocturnal, are actually preferentially moving around during the daytime. Uh, and we think they might be trying to avoid competition with all their mates who are mostly foraging at night. Mm. Um, another one from Ben Joseph. I'm interested in why we came up with the myth that fish can't feel. Yes, yes that's a really good question. Um, look, I, I, honestly, I have no idea where this came from. Um, for a long time, I partly blame animal activists, believe it or not. For a long time, you know, perhaps since the 60s and 70s, there's been a really big um, movement by um, the RSPCA and others, particularly in Europe. The UK was a, a leader in this field of animal welfare for a very long time. And there are a lot of NGOs and, and others that have been pushing animal welfare for a very long time. It mostly focused originally on, on common farm animals, pigs and sheep and cattle. Um, companion animals, dogs, 
and cats. Um, but eventually it spread to all terrestrial animals. But for whatever reason, it never made it to fish. Um, the NGOs admit, they put their hand up and they'll say, yep, we dropped the ball there. And I think that's because they were going for the cute and furry. So that, that was the, the easy thing to convince people to start treating animals that are cute and furry well. Um, sadly, when it comes to animals, we tend not to think of fishes. And, and that's partly because they live in an aquatic environment that we're just completely unfamiliar with, sort of out of sight, out of mind. Um, but having said that, you know, I have a lot of friends that are, are vegetarians, but they still eat fish, which still kind of blows my mind. And many of them are scientists, so they know better. Um, so fish are not potatoes, they are animals, and they're central nervous system, the brain and, and, and whatever else is extremely similar to our own. Fundamentally, um, humans are fish with some weird tweaks. That's about it. There, there are far more similarities between us than, than differences. So how, how that happened, I don't know, but I, I certainly think it helps people sleep at night because if you look at the number of animals that are killed annually by people for human consumption and various other uses, Conservatively, it's something in the order of three trillion individuals, which is way more. It's like a thousand times more individual fish are killed uh, than all land animals combined. So the impact is kind of mind boggling. And I suspect, you know, maybe pretending that fish don't feel anything, you know, Kurt Cobain has a line in one of his songs. Um, it's okay to eat fish because they don't have any feelings. I honestly, that is to help us feel better about ourselves and our actions. Um, but we really need to change that perspective. I would argue at the moment that uh, fish welfare is the number one um, welfare problem issue in the world, and we, we're yet to start really tackling. Mm. Um, there's a, a long one from Britain, Deb Stevenson. Uh, Presumably, yes. a whole range of fish sense that marine sanctuaries are just that. I think you referred yes. to marine yes. sanctuaries earlier. Do they recognise their safe areas? Certainly, their behaviour is completely different uh, in so many different ways. If you look at um, fish within a, a marine sanctuary versus outside, their, their behaviour is completely different. The density of individuals within those um, areas are also changed. Um, so yes, I think um, Bateman Bay, Jarvis Bay and various other places where there's you know, decent sized marine national parks. Um, there's been a really big push by wrecked fishers and even commercial fishers to open some of these areas up. But you know, we've got to save something for nature, right? That's my feeling. We only conserve a minute proportion of the oceans. And there's been some recently, um, some really interesting meetings, uh, international meetings, which suggest that at a bare minimum, we should be trying to conserve something like 30% of all ocean environments, just so that we can reach some level of sustainability. And we're not even a fraction of that, nowhere near it. So we've got a really, really long way to go. Um, I think the irony is that, in fact, the data we already have about the benefits, not only to the average person in terms of going to visit these places, but they also generate huge numbers of, of fishes within those reserves, which then go out and seed the surrounding area. So mm -hmm. creating marine sanctuaries, which are safe from wreck and commercial fishing, actually bolsters the capacity of wreck and commercial fishing industries. So it's, it's an absolute no-brainer, no matter how you look at it. But in fact, the moment you make any noise about marine reserves or what have you, the hunters and fishers get off and they start ranting and raving and carrying on. And they, they carry an amazing clout with the conservative government, uh, far more than they deserve. Um, and, and that's one of the, the major problems that we currently face is this. The hunters and fishers, stupidly, are against marine reserves. Whereas mm -hmm. if they thought it through for more than five minutes, they would realise that actually it's a benefit to everybody. Mm. That's interesting. Um, look, there's one more there, and I think we'll make this the last one because we're <laughs> pursuing. 
single uh, so the, the given the, the single generations developing in aquaculture pens do such operations generate stupid fish is it more ethical to eat them rather than the wild experienced wild fish yeah, it's a, it's an interesting conundrum and and a difficult question uh, and there are so many uh, other problems associated with this i don't really know where to start um look one of the problems we have with aquaculture uh, is that it's a relatively new industry. Currently worldwide, there's about 300 odd species of fish that are uh, reared in intensive aquaculture situations. Now, part of the problem is that unlike our terrestrial um, agricultural situations, where there has literally been thousands of years of domestication, that level of domestication has not yet happened in most of our aquaculture species. Arguably, many of them are not suited to aquaculture, period. Some of them probably are. We have definitely the capacity to artificially breed and select for traits that are suitable uh, for aquaculture and, and life in captivity in the same way that we now do for cows and sheep and, and, and chickens and all these sorts of things. So we have the capacity to do that. Are we currently doing that? Not really, and certainly not to the extent that we could. The other side of the argument is that, well, if we have to go through this process, maybe we should be a bit more careful in the first place about the species we select for aquaculture. So rather than deciding that everybody likes salmon and, and therefore spending huge amounts of money in domesticating salmon, maybe we should wean people off salmon and start eating things like tilapia and catfish and, and those sorts of things that can operate uh, under much less uh, environmental um, precision, if you like. Um, they're very robust species. They'll eat just about anything. And one of the course, one of the problems with, with rearing salmon is a bit like, it's a bit like uh, feeding your sheep to the tigers and eating the tigers, right? It's the same thing with salmon. Um, you're putting way more energy into the system than you ultimately get out of it. Um, of course, they're trying to find alternatives. Uh, at the moment, we basically pillage the seas to generate the, the food that goes into those things. Um, and there are alternatives, things like um, fish meal made out of um, plant proteins and things like that. Of course, the problem with that is you end up deforesting half of Brazil so that you can rear some, some, uh, some salmon in, in Europe. So there are significant problems. And of course, at the moment, Aquaculture is growing so fast that our environmental rules and regulations have failed to keep up. Um, and so there are substantial questions about sustainability and the impacts of, of um, things like offshore salmon farms and things like that that we really need to face in the near future. Um, the general gist of the question is, yes, if you generate these super domestic fish, they're, they're more dumb <laughs> than wild fish. Um, but there is also something to be said about um, giving wild fish a good life, capturing them in humane ways and killing them rapidly. Um, that ultimately would probably be more sustainable and probably a better outcome from a welfare perspective. Um, unfortunately, our current methods of capturing and killing wild fish are nothing short of horrendous from a welfare perspective. Um, so we really need to work on that. <laughs> <laughs> we could talk all night just about yeah, I'm sure we fishing could. and aquaculture and what the best thing is to do from a sustainability perspective or a welfare perspective. Yeah. On that uh, on that note, I think we better um, uh, end it here. Um, <clears throat> sorry, and uh, I'll call on Graham Fry to uh, give you a vote of thanks from Hartley Floor and Fauna. Thanks, Colin. Cheers. Thanks for having oh. me. Uh, thanks, Carl. I heard you give a, a, a talk on, on ABC Radio, I think last year, uh, and it was a fabulous interview and you, you had a discussion about fish intelligence that blew me away and I thought, well, you'd be a great, you'd be a great person to speak at an off meeting and, uh, and I made the suggestion and thank you, you, you made the time available to come and give us a talk tonight and I certainly haven't been disappointed I'm, I'm sure all our, our quite good uh, numbers of people who tuned in also, I think we've been pretty impressed by what you've had to say. And, and I think it's just, I suppose we, we, 
take the fish or just a funny little thing and we just eat and you don't think much about it. But when you're showing us a great different perspective on what fish are like and what they can do and their intelligence, it, it does make you think a little bit um, twice about eating fish in the future. <laughs> but uh, it, it, uh, yeah, thanks, Carl. It's been a wonderful talk and, uh, and I very much appreciate you giving the time. Thank you. Yeah, pleasure. Thank you. Look, if nothing else, you know, I would never tell people don't eat fish, but at least when you do, think about them in the same way as you would when you eat any other animal, whether it's a cow or a sheep or what have you, a chicken. Think about where it came from and what its life was like. Mm. Very interesting. Okay, well, thanks again, Colin. Uh, it was a, uh, a real treat for your talk. And so, and thanks for having me. Uh, welcome to stay on. We're moving into the general business section of our um, meeting. Um, you're welcome to stay if you want to hear about the other things that we do or we're free to go. <laughs> yeah, well, actually, I, I really should check on my kids. Yeah, <laughs> I need yeah. to go to bed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you. Thanks for having me, though. Cheerio. Okay. See you People can email soon. me if they have any questions. I'm yeah, ready. okay. That's good. <laughs> That's great. Thank you. Ciao. Okay, um, and just a reminder once again to everybody out there, um, most of our talks are for this year and a bit of last year are on YouTube, uh, off YouTube channel. Scroll down and click on the button on the web, website homepage and you should get to it. And if you subscribe, you won't miss out on future videos. So. You're gonna stop this recording, Kim? Hmm? Are you going stop to stop this recording now? Um, no, I've, I've let it go.